We're in our series called Pray Like This, starting the new year with prayer and our focus on God. No better way to start the year than prayer. As we said, 21 days of prayer and fasting starts tomorrow. And so we're in a series called Pray Like This. The disciples, they saw Jesus praying and they just said, man, that's really good. So would you teach us how to pray? It says that. that will you teach us how to pray? And so Jesus, yeah, pray like this. And as I've, I've said on several occasions, I, I, I've always heard the Lord's Prayer, probably like you, but I've, I've never really prayed the Lord's Prayer. But last year in 2020, I read a book by a guy named Daniel Henderson, and I was really challenged to pray the Lord's Prayer. And I began to learn and study how deep and how wide and how vast and how strong and how vibrant this prayer is. And it's really a relation, it's about developing your relationship with Jesus, if you really understand the aspects of it. In fact, it's really the theology of Jesus. And so each week we're breaking this down. Uh, Pastor Eric did an incredible job uh, starting this. We did a worship uh, encounter last week, which was so great as we talked about the beginning of that prayer. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Uh, and we talked about, he talked about this idea of he's our Father, a loving Father. A and, and he's a holy God. But man, he wants to it just embrace us and love us and care for us. And, and so just beautiful, beautiful message and, and time we had last week. And, and so this week, we're up to the part of the prayer where it says, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. And so I, I want us to just, let's just say this prayer together. Wherever you are in your neighborhood gathering, let, let, will you say this prayer with me? Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. So today I want us to, to focus on the one part of that prayer. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. I want to talk today about submission and surrender. If you have a Bible, let's go to Matthew's gospel, Matthew chapter 20. Matthew, if you're new to the scriptures, Matthew was one of the disciples of Jesus and he wrote down the stories of Jesus. And if you don't have a Bible, it's okay. I'd encourage you to download version. It's a great uh, Bible app. I read out of the New Living Translation. So many of you I know use that. Some of you don't. It's okay. It doesn't matter what version uh, or translation you use. It's the one that you feel most comfortable with. I like this one because to me, frankly, it's just one of the easiest ones to understand. That's why I use the New Living Translation. But in Matthew's Gospel, chapter 20, uh, Jesus is with his disciples. Uh, and two of his disciples, James and John, uh, I don't know if they put their mom up to it or, or their mom is just being a, being a mom, okay? <laughs> if you're a mom, you understand this when you, read, when you hear this story, you'll get this. But go, go to verse 20. It says this, Then the mother of James and John, the sons of Zebedee, uh, came to Jesus with her sons. And she knelt respectfully to ask a favor. What is your request? Jesus asked. And she said, Well, in your kingdom, will you please let my two sons sit in places of honor next to you, one, one on your right, the other on your left? Now, let me stop here for just a moment. What, this is so important to get the context of this. She thinks that Jesus, well, she, first of all, she knows and believes that Jesus is the Messiah, the Jewish Messiah. So what she thinks is what she's been taught her whole life. When the Jewish Messiah comes, he's going to overthrow the government, and he is going to be the one in charge. He's going to reestablish an earthly kingdom. And so that's what she thinks. She comes to Jesus, and so what she's thinking here in this moment is, hey, when, when you get your earthly kingdom could my, could my sons be a part of your cabinet? Okay, that's what she's asking here. She has no idea, though, the kind of kingdom that you and I know Jesus came to build. In fact, it says this here, but Jesus answered and said, you don't know what you're asking. Are you able to drink from the bitter cup of suffering I'm about to drink? They don't know about the cross. They don't know Jesus is, is preparing to die. They know nothing of that. So like, yeah, yeah, of course we are. We're, we're able to do that. And Jesus said, well, you're going to indeed drink from my bitter cup. Because they would, the disciples, they would they would be persecuted for teaching about Jesus. Uh, they would die a martyr's death. John, being the only disciple, wouldn't, but he was boiled alive 
trying to kill him. <laughs> and the miracle of God, he's the only disciple that survived that. He says, you're going to do it, but, but I have no right to say who's going to sit on my right or my left. My father has prepared those places for the ones he has chosen. So when the other disciples, they heard about this, they're, they're pretty ticked off. They're indignant, the scripture says. But Jesus called them together. He said, you know that the rulers of this world, they lord it over their people and, and they, uh, the officials flaunt their authority over those under them. But among you, it's got to be different. The, among you... Uh, it's got to be different. Whoever wants to be a leader uh, and who, who wants to be first among you must become your, your slave. This is, this is so counter to the, the kingdom they thought he was gonna, coming to establish. For even the Son of Man, talking about himself, came not to be served but to serve others and to give his life as a ransom for many. Today I want to talk to you about submission and surrender. So let's pray and then we'll get into the word. Father, thank you for the moments we have today. We pray that wherever we are gathered in all of our neighborhood gatherings with all of our friends and our neighbors and our coworkers, and um, we just pray as we gather together that you would just help us. I know that there's a lot of distractions, but would you help us to hear exactly what it is you want us to hear in Jesus' name, amen. Wherever you are, say amen. Well, we just came through the Christmas season and in the Christmas season, everybody gets gifts. What did you get for Christmas? What was it that you got? Maybe there were some things that you got you got surprised by, some things that you were wanting for wanting, and that you got. I want to give you just a moment in your neighborhood gathering to share with those around you, just maybe with one other person, what did you get for Christmas? Did you ask for it? Did you want it? Okay? Go ahead, share that. So I, I got a few things. I, I brought them this morning. Uh, I got some gifts that I wanted. Here's a, a couple of things. This was one. Of, I wanted this thing so bad. This is a Randy Stonehill album that I've wanted forever. It's called Welcome to Paradise. Look at the cover of this thing, 1976. Now, you may be saying, I don't even, Brad, I don't even know who Randy Stonehill is. Shame on you you, my friend, okay? One of the godfathers of Christian rock. That's who this guy is. This was his first album, and it has one of my favorite songs of all time on it. It's called Lung Cancer. Uh, and it's not even on Spotify. You'd have to go to YouTube, but if you've never heard Lung Cancer, Randy Stonehill, write it down, YouTube it later. Uh, you're welcome. Um, I also got some, um, ooh, Old Spice Swagger. Yeah? Uh -huh. Here, hold, hold your... Uh, Hold your phone up uh, to to your nose. You ready? Huh? Yeah. I know what you're thinking. Brad had some swagger to him today, and I didn't know why. No why. Now you know. Um, I, I got this is this is one of my favorite gifts I got. Okay, it's a wallet. Now I gotta explain this one real quick. Okay, so I got this for my nephew, and I I didn't bust him in person, but he regifted this two years ago. He got this. I watched him open this on Christmas, and two years later, he's re-gifting the wallet that he got, which we have all done, right? I mean, I just I did that with one of my own sons. I re-gifted something to him. But there's one thing that I was wanting and I was excited about. You know what I'm talking about? Like you're waiting, you're waiting, you're waiting. Is it coming? Is it coming? And I, I was so excited about this. I wanted Jerry Seinfeld's new book, Is This Anything? I, the moment I heard this book was coming out, I was like, I've got to have this book because I'm a huge Jerry Seinfeld fan. Um, I, I was like, I can learn from this guy because it, it was going to talk about all of his uh, you know, comedic writings and things like that. So I get it, and then I open up the book on Christmas Day, and I got to be honest, I was so disappointed. I, it was... I, it wasn't. It wasn't what I thought. I, I, I thought it was going to be like an autobiography, tell stories about his life. I thought it was going. He was going to talk about how he writes his jokes. It's. It's not that at all. It's actually a book that's just nothing but his jokes. It's an. It's just a giant joke book, and it, which isn't bad. But that's not what I was looking for, and I was so disappointed. I had 
anticipated and I had been excited about it and then I got it and it wasn't what I was hoping for. We've all had that, haven't we? I mean, whether it's a Christmas gift or, or whether it's uh, uh, something that you're anticipating, it might be a, a, a job and you're, you're anticipating a promotion or you're anticipating a, a new job or, man, you, I'm going to get that, we're going to get in that new house, that apartment or, or, or whatever, all kinds of different things that we anticipate. And then, then you get it and it doesn't maybe live up to the expectation that you'd hoped. Or the new wears off a whole lot faster than you thought it would. This is why, in the Lord's Prayer, Jesus teaches us to yearn for the things of heaven. This is why Jesus says, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in what? As, it, as in heaven. See, so often, my mind it, 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 and, and my focus is on the things of this earth and not of heaven. And Jesus tells us that, man, our hearts and our minds and our attention should be on the things of heaven. And then he tells us why. Just a few verses later, he comes along and he says, here's why. Because the, the things and, and the treasures of this earth, they don't last. He says, you know, thieves come in and steal them. Moths uh, destroy them. In, in, in other words, somebody else gets that promotion. That, that new outfit suddenly is not so trendy. It wears out. That promotion isn't what you thought it would be. You get in the new apartment and it's just eventually another apartment. I think we all struggle with this. I know I, know I do. It's, just, it's not anything new. Even the disciples struggled with this. James and John struggled with this. Look back at the text in verse 20. It says, the mother of James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came to Jesus with her sons. I'm, when I hear this, I, the first thing I'm thinking is, poor Zebedee. <laughs> I mean, as a dad, I'm thinking, he's talking to his wife later, and he's going, you, you did what? Oh, man, why'd you do that to my boys? You've got to be kidding me. But, but she did. And it says she knelt respectfully, and say this with me, to what? To ask a favor. Like when someone asks you a favor, you know you're about to get a chore or an errand to run. Isn't that true? Like nobody ever comes to you and says, hey, you know what? I've, got a, I've just got too much money, and uh, could you do me a favor? Could you take some of this and just spend it on yourself? Nobody does that. Nobody, nobody ever comes to you and goes, you know what, this TV is just too big for me. I was wondering, if you do me a favor, could you take it? No. Stan Soboleski has never, ever said, hey, could you do me a favor? Would you drive my Mustang for a week? Like, no, no, he's not. If you don't know who Stan is, he's the guy who plays the keyboards. And when you're here in person, he's the guy who parks his car out, out in the back 40. Like, no one has ever done that. That's not what it is. Why? Because a favor favors the one who is asking it. And so often, our prayers are favor-flavored. Her prayer was favor-flavored. And which, by the way, that's great if you're a rapper. <laughs> Some of you got that 90s uh, reference right there. Boom. It's not so great, though, when it comes to prayer because a favor-flavored prayer is really about me. It's, it's me-centered. It's about my needs, my desires, my plans, and, and what I want. And Listen to this, in Isaiah 55, 8, in the Old Testament, the prophet Isaiah says, the Lord says this, my ways are far beyond, say this with me, anything you could imagine. God wants to do things in you and through you that you could never, ever think or imagine. Come on, turn to somebody in your neighborhood gathering right now and say, you can't even imagine what God wants to do for you. You cannot even imagine the things God wants to do for you. But instead of looking to God, we look to ourselves and our own plans, and we limit what God can do. We come to God, here's what I need you to do. And we all do it. I do it. We say, here's the plan, God, and I just, I just need you to bless it. And what God says is, you, you're thinking too small. You're thinking too little. You have no idea the plans I have for you. You have no idea the great things I have planned for your future and for your destiny. I've got so much more. And I believe this is why Jesus, in his prayer, says when we pray, we should start by praying this way. Pray like this. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done. Write this down. Submission is exchanging my mission for his mission. Submission 
is exchanging my mission for, for his mission. So here's the mother of James and John. And when you think about the request that she brought to Jesus, this was not about Jesus' mission. This was really about advancing her mission. Look, look at verse 21. Look what she says. In your kingdom, okay, again, she thinks it's going to be an earthly kingdom. Could you please let my son sit in places of honor next to you, like one on your right, the other one sitting on, on the left? Now, I, I'm, I'm a coach. I, I coached youth sports for, for years. And, I, and right now, coaching uh, coach, uh, Pastor Eric, who leads worship that you see, um, his son, coaching his son Zeke right now. Uh, we're co-coaching together, and it's, we're undefeated. Come on, somebody, put that in the chat. Whoop, whoop, we are undefeated. We haven't played a game yet, but, <laughs> but, but we're, we're undefeated. But I, listen, uh, coaches just, oh, it's just the hair on the back of your neck just stands up, and you just cringe when a parent comes to you and says, hey, hey, coach, you got a minute? Because you know they're going to pull you aside, and they're going to talk to you, hey, about their kids' playing time. Now, I'm thankful that in, I've coached for over 20 years. I've never, I've only had it happen maybe once or twice that a, a, player, a parent has actually come to me and done that. But I can tell you, in 20 years, I have never, ever had someone, in, in the history of coaching, no coaching has ever, no coach has ever had a parent come to them, pull them aside and say, hey, coach, I want to I talk to you about my son's playing time. I want to talk to you about my daughter's playing time. I think maybe they're playing too much. I think what you need to do, that one kid that ain't playing very much, could you, could you get them to, to play some more? I think, I think you could sit my kid. and have, no, no parent has ever in the history of sports ever done that before. And so often in our prayers, our prayers, instead of thinking about the things of God, we're thinking about my things and my way and my plans, and my, my prayers become favor-flavored. No one wants their prayers to be like that, that I don't, you don't. So how do you recognize? I think the key is to recognize when your prayers are favor-flavored. So let's look back at this, this story with the mom here, because this mom's request was, first of all, write this word down, it was about prosperity. Write down the word prosperity. Think about this. Her, her sons, they were fishermen. They, they were blue-collar workers. They weren't making a whole lot of money. And, and if God puts them on, or Jesus puts them on, on, on his cabinet, it suddenly they're going to go from blue collar to, to wealthy white collar. I mean, they're going to have a, a nice 401K. They're going to have a, a lake house by the Sea of Galilee. It's all going to be working out in their favor. That's what she's praying here. And it's easy to fall into prayers like this. God, would, God, would you just do me a favor? God, if, you, if I could just get this promotion, God, if I could just get this job, God, if I could just get this house, God, if I could get this apartment, or if I could, God, if you could just get me into this school or get me into this class, God, if you could just do this for me and help me with this, and all these things that we are asking God for favors. Now, are those things that I mentioned bad? I, no, I don't think those things are bad, but the question is, what's my motive? What's, what's my motive? Why, why do I want this? I mean, truthfully, many times we have needs. We have true needs. And next week, we're going to talk about God cares about our needs. We're going to talk about that next week. But so often, we're not praying, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. No, we're, we're, we're praying, my kingdom come, my will be done. So, so what's, what's my motive? Write this down. Submission is exchanging earthly prosperity for heaven's prosperity. Submission is exchanging earth's prosperity for heaven's prosperity prosperity. Think about it. The disciples, they, they never, ever achieved wealth. They, they, they never, ever had the riches that they, they thought might be theirs. In fact, they lost everything. But I would say that when we look at the scriptures and we look at their, their lives, we would say great is their reward. Think of the impact they have. We don't talk about the houses and the cars and the ways in which the disciples live. No, we talk about the impact they had on this world because heaven's prosperity looks way different than earth's prosperity. Heavenly prosperity is, is about unending mercy, abundant grace, unconditional love of the Father that, we, that Pastor Eric talked about last week. It's forgiveness. It's the kindness of God, all available to you and to me. And when I exchange my mission for his mission, I receive 
all of that. All of that is mine. I have access to grace and to mercy and to kindness and to forgiveness and to restoration and to healing and to hope. And all of those things are mine. And that, my friend, makes you rich. Come on, turn to somebody in your neighborhood gathering and say, wow, I did not know I was that rich. I did not know I was that rich. So her her request really was about prosperity. But it wasn't just about prosperity. I'd like for you to write this word down. Write down the word protection. Because her request was really also about protection. Now, you may or may not know this, but they, I think all of us know they were under Roman occupation and Ro- Roman rule. But what that meant was they were being persecuted, not just the Christians, but the Jews were being persecuted by the Romans. If you opposed them, if you, if you did anything that to defy the, the, the Roman Empire, Man, they would beat you, they would throw you in jail, and they would not hesitate to crucify you. Like, it wasn't just Jesus who was crucified. I mean, thousands and thousands and thousands of people were crucified like at no other time in history. These were very, very just cruel, cruel people to a level that most of us really can't even understand. Write this down. Submission, submission is exchanging earthly security for heaven's security. Submission is exchanging earthly security for heaven's security. I want you to just think for just a moment, what's your greatest fear? Like, so what's the one thing you're like, uh, that is what I'm afraid of? I want you in your neighborhood gather, I'll give you just a moment, I want you to share with somebody around you, what is it that freaks you out and that scares you? Share that. So I, listen, we're, we're, we're all afraid at times. We all have things that we are afraid of. I, I know there's things that I, one of my, one of life's great regrets for me, just to be transparent, is uh, about 10 years ago, I was with a group of buddies and we were at Grand Lake and we went over to Dripping Springs. Some of you know about Dripping Springs and there's the cliffs and you can jump off the cliffs and all the guys are like, we're jumping off the cliffs. And I'm like, yeah, we're jumping off the cliffs. Yeah. And then we got to the cliffs. And I looked up at that cliff, and I'm like, I can do this, I can do this. And I started to climb up the rocks, and, uh, and I thought, no, no, I'm, I'm not doing this. That's, this is too crazy. I'm not doing that. And, and honestly, it's, it's been one of my great regrets. I can tell you this, following Jesus is risky. There is a great risk. And if you don't, if you don't sense the risk in following Jesus, I want to challenge you this morning. Am I, am I following? Because if you're comfortable, if it's just easy, you don't think much about it, you got to ask yourself, am I really following? Because if you're following Jesus, he's going to lead you right into risk. It's going to cost you something, okay? There's going to be a leap of fear. Like, you heard me right. I did not say leap of faith. I think it's a leap of fear. Like, I am freaking out. I don't know how this is going to end. I don't know where God has taken me, but this is what he's telling me to do. It may cost me everything. I may not receive the rewards of this earth. Things may go badly for me here on this earth, but I'm going to do this for the cause of Christ. Like, when's the last time you thought that way? When's the last time you said, I'm going to lay it all on the line. I'm going to do whatever. I don't care about my reputation. I'm willing to take that risk. The disciples, they were willing to take the risk. They did not pray safe prayers. They prayed, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. There's, there's this incredible story. Later, after Jesus' resurrection, he ascended to heaven. The Holy Spirit has come, and Peter and John are out preaching the gospel. They get arrested. They get beaten, and, and they're in prison, but there's this miracle where an angel comes and frees them from the prison, and they go back to where all of the believers are gathered and all the believers are praying for them. And when they get there, you, you would think that the believers would start praising God and thanking God, which they do, and then you think the very next thing they do is say, they pray, God, would you protect us? God, would you watch over us? God, would you keep us safe? 
They didn't pray that. In fact, actually what they prayed was this, make us bold. I think somebody needs to write that down right now. Where You need to write that down and make that your anthem for 2021. Make me bold. Come on, turn to somebody in your gathering and say, hey, God's going to make you bold. God is going to make you bold. What do I mean by that? It costs the disciples everything. They they lost their lives. They were martyred for their faith, all of them except for John, and he was boiled alive. They lost everything, but they changed the entire world. And their greatest reward was in heaven, their eternal security in heaven. Do you think any of them, any of those who were martyred for their faith and for the cause of Christ, as Hebrews tells us, do you think any of them regret any, any of that? No. Because they know they, it was a life well lived. And I think instead of praying risky prayers, so often we're praying risk adverse prayers. And I want to challenge you in your prayers in, in 2021. Stop praying safe prayers of, of comfort and security. Safe prayers never change the world. Safe prayers never change the world. So her, her request was about prosperity. It was about protection. The third word I want you to write down is this power. Her request was about power. Remember, Roman occupation, Roman rule. She's thinking in this moment, I mean, because the Romans, they would oppress them, and and you had to go where they said to go, do what they said to do, say what they had to say. I mean, the taxes, all of it. They they had to submit to Roman rule, and she's thinking in her mind, going to finally flip it. Going to finally flip it, and things are going to be different. I don't know if you've seen the movie Nacho Libre, but there's a great scene in there where um, Nacho is in a submission hold by, by one of the wrestlers. And when you see this, I think many times, do you ever feel this way in life? Like this is how life can feel. Like life has got you in a submission hold. My kids have got me in a submission hold. My parents have got me in a submission hold. My boss has got me, my finances have got me in a submission hold. And, and I think for most of us, we're praying, God, God, would you flip it? Like in Nacho Libre, like flip it like this. God, would you flip it like this? Aha, yeah, now now who's your daddy, okay? Who, now who is in charge? Yeah, I'm gonna show you. Now, now I'm in control. And I'm, so often our prayers are really about control. Not giving up control to the Father, but, but really taking control. But write, write this down. Submission, submission is exchanging earthly control for heaven's control. Submission is exchanging earthly control for heaven's control. See, the, the other 10 disciples we read earlier, they heard about this and they overheard the whole thing and they really ticked off because they saw we're losing control. They're gonna get control. We're not gonna be in control. They're gonna be our bosses. We gotta get in on this as well. And Jesus says, whoa, 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 whoa. Okay, let me sit you down. Let me teach you something. It's, it's gonna be different for you. Now, when Jesus, in these next words, and I'm gonna read these here in a moment, when Jesus read these, or when Jesus spoke these words to his disciples, he was speaking them to you and I. You know that the rulers in this world, they lord it over their people and officials flaunt their authority over those under them. But among you, it will be different. Come on, turn to somebody and say, it's gotta be different. It's gotta be different. Whoever wants to be a leader among you must be your servant and whoever wants to be first among you must become your slave. For even the son of man came not to be served, but to serve others and to give his life as a ransom for many. Jesus is saying here, if you follow me, you gotta live different. You gotta exchange control and power for serving. So often our prayers are, God, I, God, how, you know, how do I get them to do this? And God is saying, no, no, I want you to change your prayer. What if you started praying, God, how can I serve them? How can I help them? How can I love them? How can I, how can I care for them? This is what I love about the people of Core Church. You, you saw it on our Celebration Sunday uh, video where we celebrated the good things that the people of Core Church are doing. Man, you talk about serving. I love the example of our people serving in our community, serving in the prisons, uh, feeding over 65,000 people here locally, helping people dealing with addiction in their lives, uh, making masks, uh, groceries, meals, going, sitting with people in the hospital. And just recently, over the Christmas season, you might remember this, 
And I challenged you, and we talked about going out, inviting your neighbors, and baking something for them, and just loving on them during the Christmas season, just showing them tangibly the love of God by, by maybe baking something for them and inviting them to church. Well, Tammy Slaymaker, some of you know Tammy. She's one of the leaders in our church, and Tammy took it to the next level. She went out and she baked, I think it was 30 pies, 30 pies, and delivered them to all of her neighbors. Like that is next level serving and generosity. This is who we are. This is who the people of Core Church are. This is what we do. We exchange our mission for the mission of God. So what could God do through you? Because you start praying, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. 